Hello, 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 everyone. It's 8 a.m. in Hong Kong, 1 a.m. in London, and 8 p.m. here in New York City. Please share this global conversation by sharing with your friends, by tagging your friends around the world so they can join us. Please retweet from our Twitter account of HK University, from the Facebook page you can share at HKU100, and you can find us on fightcovid19.hku.hk. Welcome to this live global conversation about the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. I'm honored to moderate this discussion brought to you by the University of Hong Kong. This is part of a series for all of us to learn lessons from what's happening in the region. Last week, we spoke to Professor Tasha Lee to learn about the psychological aspects of the crisis. Today, we're taking your questions about the topic of the impact on higher education. We have the perfect guest for these issues. Professor Ian Holliday has served as Vice President Teaching and Learning at HKU since 2015. He oversees all aspects of the postgraduate and undergraduate curricula, including policies, quality assurance, and aspects of strategic direction. Professor Holliday is most passionate about teaching and learning. Before taking up his current role, he served for five years as the Dean of Social Sciences at the university. Under his leadership, the faculty introduced a requirement that in order to graduate, students must complete off-campus credits in social innovation and global citizenship. We'll surely ask him about that. He also created, and for many years, many years directed a program for undergraduate students to teach English classes to children and young adults in Southeast Asian countries like Cambodia, Myanmar, and Thailand. Professor Holliday graduated from Cambridge with a BA and MA in Social and Political Studies and an MPhil and DPhil from Oxford. His research focuses on Myanmar politics and governance and is the author of a number of books on Myanmar. He's here today to talk about HKU and how it has managed COVID-19. Please welcome Professor Holliday. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. How are you? Thank you for making the time. We're My taking goodness. questions from around the world via the hashtag HKUCOVID19 and ask you to leave your comments on Facebook Live HKU100 by, or by email fightcovid19 at hku.hk. Thank you again for making the time. We are here at nighttime in New York. We're under lockdown in New York for 56 straight days. But in Hong Kong, you're already looking ahead and past the COVID-19 crisis. Yesterday, we logged 17 days with, of zero local transmissions. The target's 28. Uh, the government is already starting to relax some of the restrictions on uh, that have been placed on Hong Kong. Of course, we never had a lockdown. Uh, but we did have restrictions on use of restaurants, uh, bars were closed, um, many other venues were closed. But we're, we're, we're looking ahead now and uh, hoping that we'll soon be out of it. Well, we're jealous of hearing that because in New York, which is the epicenter of the epicenter in many ways, we never thought that we would be in this situation and we have a long way to go. Uh, what are some of the ways in which you think that Hong Kong has had a different experience than the United States? I think fundamentally the Hong Kong people have been exemplary in the way in which they have responded to this crisis. There's been no pushback on public health uh, requirements. Nobody has thought that it's an act of resistance or rebellion uh, not to wear a face mask or not to wash your hands or not to social, socially distance. Um, so I, I think in that sense, the, the Hong Kong people are the heroes of, of our COVID-19 story. Um, of, of course, we did go through SARS 14, uh, 17 years ago in 2003. And so that has conditioned the Hong Kong people to take these sorts of things seriously. So when we knew of the first case in, on January the 23rd in Hong Kong, when before that we heard that it was uh, spreading in Wuhan, uh, people were already taking to wearing face masks and, and being much more careful on public transport and in crowded places. Thank you. Let's take a look at some of the folks who are watching from around the world. Please keep, hit, keep sharing this so your friends can join us. Leon says, good morning. Uh, Jonathan's watching from the East Village here in New York. Renee Edelman is listening from New York City. Arlene says, 
Uh, he's been waiting and excited to uh, participate here. Uh, Hedera says, hello, Professor Holiday. And we have uh, Pradnia watching from Silver Spring. Uh, thank you, Pradnia, for being here. Shiyun says, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are just so happy to have all of you here. Audrey says, good morning. Christine notices that Jonathan's always on our shows and listening and watching. That's great. Carly says, good morning. Uh, Sonali says, hello to HKU. So you're seeing we're having this really global conversation and it's great. Sonali says, I was just in Singapore, so well managed, nothing like the mess in the United States. And I know you were talking about Hong Kong and how it handled it, but there is, Professor, we cannot help but compare and contrast that to the US and how everyone has been given different directions, uh, uh, kind of competing information and a lot of false information from many different sources have flooded the American scene. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, there's, there are also issues of trusting government here. We went through political protests at the end of last year, which were polarizing in the way that US politics is also polarized. But I would say that in this crisis since January, people have put that to one side and have come together to, to fight COVID-19. It's, it's the mantra that we live by here in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, you, you can't take a, a subway train, you can't move around the city without seeing that kind of uh, coming together around the idea that the whole society needs to mobilize to fight this virus. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Anita says, nice show, have a beautiful day. And Anand is watching from Andhra Pradesh in India. And Mike says, good morning, Professor Ian, and thank you for being here. I think this is great. We have so many questions. So can we get right to them, Professor? Please do, yeah. Yeah, all right. Uh, Hong Kong a HKU has moved all classes online at the end of January, weeks and months and uh, ahead of universities in other parts of the world. Can you talk about that, about how you decided to do it? In America, it seemed haphazard. Many of the top institutions gave their students two days to suddenly go online. The students weren't ready and the teachers weren't ready. So again, we had a trial run. I just mentioned that we had political protests in Hong Kong in the fall of 2019. And um, that meant that we actually went online in the middle of November because our campuses were, um, it was almost impossible to get public transport to come to Hong Kong U by the middle of November. Many of our international students did not want to be in Hong Kong because the streets were becoming um, quite contested. And so we shifted online for the final two weeks of teaching in November and also for exams in December. We expected then that we would be moving back to face-to-face -to -face teaching, and we did that for one week in January. But then at Chinese New Year, at the end of January, the virus flared up in Hong Kong. And so we went online from the first uh, week in February, from February the 3rd. Uh, so I would say we, we were also quite haphazard in, in November. It was, it was something that took the institution by surprise the, the, the impact of the protest took the institution by surprise in the way that the virus has taken the world by surprise. And we'd done some things with online learning. We had colleagues who'd made a MOOC, we'd had colleagues who'd flipped a class who were used to using technology as a platform for their teaching, but it was a niche interest and a minority interest. And the key challenge we faced then, and that we, I think many other institutions around the world face today, is how to make a minority interest into the mainstream business of the university and to make sure that everybody and, and that teaching quality is not just good for the enthusiasts for e-learning and virtual and online learning, but for everybody, even those who thought they would never have to deal with this because they're three or four years from retirement and this is not gonna be part of their teaching experience, but everybody now has to be part of this online movement of teaching and learning because we're all forced to go online. So were you surprised to see the way things turned out in US colleges, the kind of chaos that you were watching? I know you had an advantage because of the crisis you faced and the turbulence you faced in November, but was there anything you think universities in America could have done differently? Um, I, I, I think the key things that we've done are try to provide as much support as possible to colleagues and to students. So we've, from the beginning, from November, we've always had a troubleshooting unit in, in one of our central offices called Tele, the Technology Enriched uh, Learning Initiative, whereby colleagues could send a WhatsApp to two phone numbers 
manned by actual people, Leon and Tyrone, my colleagues, who would respond to them in WhatsApp and maybe actually deal with the query through WhatsApp. And if that wasn't good enough, then they would migrate to Zoom and talk the colleague through what they needed to do to uh, whatever the issue was that they faced. If they wanted to do lecture capture and they weren't sure how to do that through their laptop, if they weren't sure how they could do it through a centrally booked classroom, if they wanted to have some uh, advice on how to conduct a Zoom tutorial. These kinds of things, we had a, um, a live, real-time troubleshooting service. We also had ongoing webinars. Uh, we had emails where you could write in and somebody would respond to you within a matter of hours for both colleagues and students. So we tried to ensure that we had a, a central organization that could respond to all of the queries that were bubbling up across the campus. And sounds like you did a great job with that. That was missing almost everywhere here. And I think, Professor, there is that divide that you mentioned that some people were enthusiastic about digital learning for years, maybe even decades, and others who still love a certain way of teaching. I myself have been, uh, been a professor for more than 25 years. I think there's still nothing better than a professor and a classroom of 20, 25 students all working together and in the same space. But I see value on the digital scale and reach. How do you think about the philosophy of that? I think there's there's good on all sides of TNL. I mean, you know, a, a, a great professor who has command of a lecture hall and has a hundred students just just waiting for the next sentence. Yeah, that's fantastic. And we all grew up with that experience. Not, not all of our professors were great, but we all have that knowledge in our background. And I think that should be a part of a, a student journey at the undergraduate level of just somebody who's totally in command of their discipline and is a brilliant uh, communicator in, in, in relaying all of that to students. But alongside that, we've learned a lot in these weeks and months from the value of online teaching. I think one of the things we would say in Hong Kong is that we've been talking about flipping classrooms for a long time, but we haven't been doing very much of it. We've Again, we've had the enthusiasts and and they've been holding seminars on the campus and they've taught us what a great job they've done. But I wouldn't say that the, the spread has been that great. But now everybody wants to know about that. How do you successfully flip a classroom? Because I'm myself, I'm doing it. And, and online tutorials as well. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a little bit more resistance to speaking in class in Asia, if I can be very, very kind of broad in my comment, um, than there would be maybe in North America. But I think that some of our teachers are reporting that students are more part, more willing to participate in an online tutorial than they were face to face. Some of them don't actually come online through their webcam. They are just coming online through their audio, which, which is fine. That's how they're going to contribute by making a statement, by, by uh, contributing to the discussion. And some students are more comfortable doing that behind the veil, if you like, of, of a a Zoom tutorial than they would be in a face-to-face -face small class setting. So I remember going to one of our faculties a few weeks ago with the president and talking about this. And one colleague who joined us through Zoom said, I have had a better teaching experience with my students through Zoom than I ever had in the classroom. Wow, that's saying something, isn't it? That's, uh, well, I think the key thing is, so your question was, you know, what do we make of all of this? The key thing is how can we distill all of the benefits that, we've, that we're have that we gaining, that institutions in the States, institutions in Asia and around the world are gaining from this forced experiment with online learning? It's a, it's, it's a mass experiment now, whereas before we were doing it in a much more controlled fashion. How do we distill all of the good lessons and keep those alongside what, what it was we liked about the face-to-face? -face? We have a visual to show folks about how you were dealing with this and here is a half day virtual forum that you showed uh, i thought it was very interesting can you talk us through what we're looking at it's coming up on monday uh, 10 o'clock till two o'clock hong kong time so all it is is the raw experience of hong kong u during the past six months we've been we've been screening weekly videos and as i said we've had some webinars and things and turns out, you know, many of my colleagues have been doing a fantastic job with their online teaching. And we want to capture that in, a, in this four hour webinar. So first two hours will be on pedagogy and the final two hours will be on assessment. 
and, and I should just put down a marker there that I think assessment is one of the biggest challenges that we face in the move online. So we can maybe pick that up a bit later. And that's why we're allocating the final half of this webinar to looking at assessment challenges. But yes, it, it, it's just bringing, giving teachers a platform to say, this is what I did. And this is what worked for me. And this is what didn't work for me. And this is what I've learned from it. Thank you so much. We have many, many questions and comments coming in from around the world. And we're so grateful, everyone. Please continue to tag us and share this video with your friends as we talk about how you know, Hong Kong University, the University of Hong Kong, has learned so much about teaching and learning at this moment. Our guest is Professor Ian Holiday, who is in charge of TNL, as he calls it, teaching and learning. Use the word flipped classroom. Can you explain what that is? The basic concept is that what ordinarily or historically would have been delivered didactically by a professor standing in front of a class for say an hour or two hours, that bit gets flipped. So the professor would record that material, put it online ahead of meeting with students, and then use the session with them to discuss the material that has been delivered through the online segment. So instead of using the two hours just to passively listen to a professor, Students do that in their own time before the class, and then they come on and actively come onto campus and actively engage with the professor through that two hour segment. So it can be used extremely creatively because it means that the students now have two full hours to dialogue with the professor about the material that was going to be delivered in that two hour segment, but instead they've watched it online before the class. So that's what the flipping concept means. And that's something that most students and teachers are not used to when they first started this process because they thought teaching meant just delivering your lecture in that in that Zoom right. setting. And so yeah. trying something new, experimenting is important. And I think that the well, way sorry. If, if, sorry, if I could just chip in, focusing on the active and the interactive, I think that's one of the things that comes out of this experiment is how can we uh, capture as much interactive learning as possible from this experience? Because there are a lot of resources that can be just planted online. I mean, students are used to going online. They're used to doing Google searches to reading Wikipedia and everything else. That's how they gain information. What we want to do is to actually engage in dialogue with them and interactive learning with them. Um, and, and, and the online is enabling us to expand their ways of doing that. All right, we have so many questions. We're going to go for some quick questions and quick answers. Alejandro asks, with the radical shift of education online, once the crisis subsides, will there be a significant disruption in higher education learning, a significant shift away from traditional residential social model to something new, a hybrid perhaps? Well, Alejandro, thank you very much for raising that question. Um, we're colleagues at Hong Kong U in some parts of the U and Alejandro com comes here on campus. I, I think yes and no. I mean, I, I, I think many institutions, we're obviously the kind of classic ocean liner that takes years and decades to maneuver and, and, and shift. And in many respects, institutions will breathe a sigh of relief and go back to what they've always been doing. Um, and it'll still be, I think, quite a, a, a fight, a, a battle to actually ensure that all the good things that we've done in these months actually are captured and are fed into uh, teaching and learning. But that said, I mean, that th there are going to be some shadow effects. There's, this is not just going to go away. And in September, when Northern Hemisphere universities come back, you know, we're, we're not going to say, well, campus is back to normal. And that was interesting, but we don't need to do any more of it. Uh, we're, we're already moving to suspend exchange programs, for instance, and that's a, a key part of global exposure for students around the world. Um, most students in, 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 in many of the top institutions around the world would expect to have at least one semester of study abroad, and that probably won't happen in this calendar year. And that means that we're going to try to find ways of putting them together virtually. You were going to go to uh, an institution in the US or in the UK Let's see if we can put your classrooms together. And at least for a couple of sessions, you know, you're studying constitutional law, so are we. Let's see if we can actually put our students together. And uh, on, 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 on a topic of overlap, they can, they can debate some of the issues as a, as a, a bilateral 
um, two groups of students connected virtually. So some of that I think will will survive, and 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 who knows what the resistance is going to be to uh, student travel. Yes. Hong, Kong, Hong Kong, many Hong Kong students come out of high school and go overseas for their undergraduate, but there'll be less of that this year, I think. Okay, we have a question for you from Rosanna Sang, who is a big supporter of Hong Kong University herself, her husband and daughter are all graduates of HKU, and her son is an undergraduate at HKU at present, so all the way with HKU. Uh, she has a question, how would quality of teaching and learning be assured for, say, next year, uh, given that the pandemic still exists or returns and online learning continues to be adopted, and how would the quality of that teaching be assured? Yeah, I mean, we're expecting to have a hybrid mode when we come back in September. Uh, for one thing, many students around the world who, who are, will be coming to Hong Kong U for either to join us as freshmen or to join us as returning students may not be able to come to Hong Kong U by September the 1st. We know that there could still be quarantine arrangements in place. So, you know, it, even if they got here by late August, they would still have to spend two weeks in quarantine before coming on campus. So chances are we will spend the first few weeks offering classes both face-to-face -face and online. So come on campus if you can, but if you can't, here's how you can participate online. We also need to be prepared for return waves of the virus next winter, where we might have to go online again at short notice and um, repeat some of the, the lessons that we've learned from this year. So yes, I mean, Rosanna, I think that's a, that's, that's a great question. The, the, the quality, we, we, what we try to do is, is, is to set minimum standards and then to drive standards above that. So mm. we, the minimum standard, of course, is that colleagues should, should put either an annotated PowerPoint or a, a, a spoken to PowerPoint online. So this may be what they would have done in their lecture. They would have come in with a PowerPoint and spoken to it. So either do that as, as a basic form of flipping a classroom or provide it to students in an annotated form so that what they would have spoken is, is given as, as notes. But we also ask colleagues to, to do more than that, to make themselves available. Some, some colleagues, when they put their material online, they do so in the actual lecture slot, but instead of delivering the lecture, they make it available to students and they have a discussion around it so that students are engaging with the material and maybe through a chat box function in Zoom, they're putting up a question, you know, you, you say this in your fifth slide, but I don't quite understand that. Could you please explain it? And the whole group, of course, is able to view that conversation um, through the, the chat box function. And so it's a way of, again, making an, a lecture a little bit more interactive with students. Uh, we also uh, enable uh, students to, of course, dialogue with students outside of the lecture, outside of that slot. So we have virtual office hours, we have virtual academic advising sessions, and we encourage use of email and, 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 and sometimes WhatsApp uh, for, for colleagues and students to get together. One of the things that will be surprising to our friends in Hong Kong and the region is that not everyone in America uses WhatsApp. It's something that they're getting used to, but most Americans have not found a use for it yet. Uh, let's see, people are greeting us from around the world. Caitlin says, I am here. Uh, Ashok is watching from India in Kerala, and he uh, he says, in these present times, these types of teaching methods are really important. And so we have lots of questions coming in. We want to ask you a question from a current student, Uzair uh, bin C. Asim, who's a HKU student, says, I want to know about the plans to reopen HKU for September. And you talked about a little bit of hybrid, perhaps, learning. Mm -hmm. His question is, uh, for students who are wanting to come to HKU, or, and are worried about travel, which they may not be able to control, which the university cannot control. Will, what do you think about students taking a gap semester? We would certainly try to facilitate that. Uh, that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be a problem for us. We've already said to students in this year that we, we've offered them both for semester one and semester two courses, three choices in terms of assessment. One is that they retain the letter grade, A, B, C, D, F system. The second is they shift to a pass-fail because they're not quite so sure about how the standards are going to play out this semester, or we allow them to late drop. So right up until a week ago, students could late drop their courses from this semester. We're only a week away from the end of the semester. So basically, they could have taken the entire semester, but still 
up till April the 30th, they could late drop their entire course load and come back next year for free. So that in effect means they've taken a gap semester this semester and that they will be picking it up again next semester. So we want students to have as much choice as possible. They of course have to have take the responsibility of how they exercise that choice. But we recognize that there are many challenges in all of this, not only for teachers in, in going online, but also for students in navigating the online. And for some students it works well, but for other students it doesn't work so well. So as I say, if students want to just drop the entire year, come back next year and do it again for free, then that's fine with us. So that sounds like a very generous way of approaching this professor. Uh, and uh, lots of places are not looking at it uh, that way. We have a question here um, from Nitin Paul, who says, do you, uh, he's watching, by the way, from Dharamshala in, uh, in northern India. And he says, do you think crowdsourcing ideas over tech platforms will be widely used as a way of teaching? We haven't done any of that so far. <laughs> um, conceivably, I mean, I'd, I'd like to say thank you very much for the idea. And we will add it into the long list of ideas that, we, that we're taking from this experience. But I don't know of any of my colleagues who've done that. Um, and, but yeah, it's one for the future for us. Thank you. Folks, you're listening to a conversation with Professor Ian Holliday, VP and Pro Vice Chancellor of Teaching and Learning, TNL at HKU. We're all learning from him and his colleagues about how they are handling the crisis. Since you were so close to the end of the semester, Professor, did you consider not opening up the campus or did it make sense to just kind of ease things back in the way you have? We're not, we, we, we've always had an open campus. Right. We've, our dorms have never closed. Uh, students every single day for the last six months have been able to come on campus, and many of them have. I mean, given that Hong Kong students tend to live in quite restricted accommodation with maybe several generations of an extended family living in one space. So they don't necessarily have a study area that they can sit quietly or even participate in a Zoom tutorial quietly. We've made available spaces on campus, our library, our learning commons, we've made them as available as possible to students. Um, we haven't gone back online for this final week or two, uh, back to face to face for the final week or two, other than for essential face to face teaching. One of the things we did at the beginning was try to work out that kind of aspect of TNL that we simply couldn't deliver virtually. Uh, clinical placements, internships, lab sessions, studio sessions all fit into that category. Now, in the last few weeks, we have brought students in in very small groups of four at a time into our labs to do their lab work, into our studios for say architectural work. We've been doing that over the last few weeks. But one of the things we wanted to do in, in January, February, when we were confronting the virus and looking ahead through the whole of the semester was to give students some clarity. So what we said to them was, you will be able to complete your semester online. That meant that students who, for instance, were still in mainland China for Chinese New Year, hadn't yet come back to Hong Kong, could stay in China and know that they would be able to complete their semester. They wouldn't have to have any concerns about that. For students who were in South Asia or who were in Europe and who were in North America, they didn't have to come to Hong Kong. And at that stage, of course, the virus wasn't known to be in Europe. It wasn't known to be in North America. So for many of our students, they felt the safe option for me is not to go anywhere near Hong Kong in this semester, but nevertheless, to do my, 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 my classes virtually and to gain my credits in this semester. So again, that was another aspect of the choice that we wanted to present students with. Thank you, Professor. We have about 15 minutes left with you and we're getting a ton of questions, which is so, so great. Uh, just to ask, how did you keep the students safe on campus despite you know, all the turmoil on, you know, in, in the region? How did you manage to keep them safe and keep those dorms open? because so many places said the dorms will be open, kept them open, and then had to close all of a sudden. Mm. I mean, as I said at the beginning, the Hong Kong people themselves have been absolutely exemplary throughout this entire experience. The Hong Kong people uh, are, are, are attuned to public health issues and naturally move into kind of public health crisis mode when something like this flares up. So we have all of the guidelines about mask wearing, um, 
But that, that, of course, is a contested issue in the United States and in some other places. It's not contested here. Everybody wears a mask when, when, when they walk around the campus and when they're off campus as well. And we're still doing that even now, even now that we're moving to, as I said, 17 days of zero local transmission. But we're still wearing masks. We're still distancing ourselves socially. We're still holding as many uh, campus meetings online as well. So most of our meetings take place through Zoom, just as our classes do. And in, in the dorms, we have, um, we're at about one third to about 35 to 40% occupancy. So in, in a kind of natural way, because some students didn't come back, they stayed in mainland China, they stayed in other parts of the world. And obviously those are the students who would be, would be staying in dorms. Um, so we've naturally had a lower density in the dorms, just, just by choices that students themselves have made. And that has made it easier for us to have social distancing. But as I say, people in Hong Kong naturally divert into that mode of living and being when this kind of crisis comes around. But the, the key thing for us is, is low density on campus, in classrooms, if we have any face-to-face, -face, and also in, in the dorms. Thank you. Let's go to a question from Rosanna, who says, with students having a choice to use pass or fail grades instead of a letter grade, I'm worried that transcript filled with pass grades would not be competitive. Is this a problem? It could be, but it, I mean, again, we, we get, we, that's how we advise students. We, we say to students, we're giving you these choices. If you, if you opt for pass-fail for an entire semester or even an entire year, and students have that choice at Hong Kong U in this academic year, be aware of how that might impact on the choices you have further down the line. It may mean that if you apply to graduate school in the United States, somebody is going to look at your transcript and say, well, this is odd. You know, how come you have so much pass on your transcript rather than A's, B's and C's? And even a future employer might, might look at it and say, how come? Why, why so much? Some students have said to us, well, could you please put a footnote on our transcripts to say the reason why many students in this year have more pass fail than letter grade is, is this. And, and, and I said, no, we're not going to do that. I mean, you, you need to take responsibility for these choices. And of course, you can explain it yourself. If, if an employer in an interview says to you five years from now, why is this? You can explain that and say, this was the situation I faced. I, I wasn't confident with that I was navigating the course materials as successfully as I would have done on a face-to-face -face mode, and that's why I chose pass-fail. That could be a very good explanation to give to an employer. But yes, I mean, as I said, we give choices to students. They take the responsibility for how they exercise that choice. Thank you. Dr. Naoko Kumuda from Bard College has a question. Uh, Bard College is in New York, as you know. Myanmar has 161 confirmed cases and six deaths as of May 4th. How can Hong Kong, which has great experience and knowledge in handling pandemics, what can Hong Kong teach and help? How can it uh, neighbors like Myanmar? And we should just rem remind everyone that you're a great expert on Myanmar. You've written multiple yeah. books. That's your research. I was there as a young child and just a beautiful wow. country. Um, mm. that has gone through lots of turmoil politically, economically, uh, socially, but uh, still the people and the uh, and and the land is so special. Yeah, I mean, of course, I worry about all my friends in Myanmar because the the, the public health situation in Myanmar is not good. The economic situation in, in Myanmar is not good. Um, you know, in many other countries and Myanmar itself has moved into lockdown, but many people just can't afford to go into lockdown. I mean, they 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 simply have to go out and earn a living. Otherwise, their family will, 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 will not survive for other reasons. And so solutions from the developed world are not immediately translatable into the Myanmar context because it simply doesn't have the infrastructure, nor does it have the level of economic development to enable it to adopt solutions which have worked elsewhere. But I mean, the basic things that I've been talking about in Hong Kong, wearing a mask, washing your hands repeatedly and, and, and washing lengthily, and distancing yourself socially from people, um, not, not going into crowded spaces, not using public transport as much as, as you did. May, maybe in fact you don't need to and you can walk 
my own case, I haven't used any transport at all for about two months now. I've literally walked everywhere in that period. Um, you know, th these are the kinds of solutions that can be adopted in any country in the world. And they're basic and, and fundamental and, and they work. Got it. How did you fall in love with Myanmar? Because you must have in order to uh, dedicate your scholarly life to it so much. I'm interested in British colonial impacts um, and anywhere in the world. I mean, I think if you're British, then you have a responsibility to take, you, you may agree with me about this. <laughs> you may have an interest, you have a responsibility to take an interest on the impact that your forebears had on colonized societies. Myanmar as Burma was one of those societies. So that's how I became interested in it. And, and here's a tip for everybody who's watching who's an academic. There are fewer people studying Myanmar than, say, India or, mm. uh, or other places, right? Yeah. So you made a good call. Uh, <laughs> and, and while we're on that subject of studying, you studied in both Cambridge and in Oxford. Talk about that for a minute, please. What do you want me to say? They're great institutions. <laughs> I mean... Well, um, we don't, you know, you normally see one person dedicating their academic career to one place or the other. Was there anything that you learned at each place that you kind of live with every day and you try to put into your work? Well, I learned that it's much more fun being an undergraduate student than it is being a research postgraduate student. I mean, I, you know, I hated writing a dissertation because it's just a very lonely business. It's, it's you and your thesis and it's three years of that. Whereas being an undergraduate student, it's you and your friends and it's discussion and all, all of that. So, you know, anybody who's going through a, a dissertation, uh, my thoughts are with you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have about 10 minutes less than that left with Professor Ian Holliday. Thank you so much, Professor, for being here. Teresa, who is a lecturer from Hong Kong Baptist University, says, what are your views on how to respond to students' angst and sometimes their angsty and disruptive behavior in class when using video conference software. Not totally sure what um, Teresa means by that. Um, well, you know, sometimes, uh, you, I mean, we can, we can say we have seen videos of students that are calling in from bed and their camera is off or they're in the dark and they're a little, yeah. um, little angry or upset and depressed yeah. and all of that. I mean, I mean, we don't insist on cameras on for Zoom tutorials, we do insist, insist on cameras on for uh, any assessment task. So we allow students to put a, the virtual background in Zoom, um, to turn off their camera if they want, but we, we don't see that as disruptive. I mean, the key thing is that a student is contributing to the conversation that is taking place and is doing so on the basis of reading and knowledge and engaging with the material. and. On the whole, I would say that students are doing that at least as well. When we look at attendance in Zoom tutorials, it's just as good as the face-to-face -face on campus. When we look at engagement through the, the Zoom tutorials, there we don't have any statistics, but talking to my colleagues, the broad sense is that there's just as much participation. Um, it's different in some ways, but it's as good. It's a kind of apples and oranges thing to some extent, but it's just as good as the face-to-face -face in many respects. Okay, we have just a few minutes left. We're gonna read you some of these questions. Here's one from Nimisha uh, who says, how about the financial burden of using internet to study? Not everyone has equal access to the internet. Yes, yeah, it, that, that's an issue for us because our students come from a hundred jurisdictions around the world. Wow. And are now pretty much in those hundred jurisdictions. You know, we, we, have, we have students in rural China, in rural South Asia, um, internet speeds are, are not good. Um, there's, there's a limit to what we can do. We, we, we do have an, a financial assistance fund that students can apply to on a case-by-case -case basis. So you know, it doesn't make sense for us to give students blanket financial support for internet access because 90 odd percent of our students don't need that form of financial support. They have excellent internet access because they live in a you know, central Hong Kong somewhere. Um, but there are students who are living in more peripheral parts. And yes, that is some, that is an issue. And it's an issue, again, when we come to things like assessment, um, because if, you, if your internet goes down in the middle of a Zoom tutorial, no problem. But if your internet goes down in the middle of a, of a Zoom exam, more of a problem. So we, we've, had to, we've had to face that. Of course, for any student in Hong Kong, they can come on campus and the internet 
which which is a challenge or at least was until recently a challenge because that would often mean using public transport and that therefore is putting yourself in some danger of infection um, but nevertheless we've always kept the campus open as i said earlier and made learning spaces open to our students and many of them have come on campus to make use of those facilities all right, we're going to read your two questions together. One is from FC Ching. What is the learn? What if the learning experience requires placement practicum? Uh, what what? How can virtual learning help on that? And a question that has also come in uh, from Lisa, who's a lecturer at HKU, one of your constituents, so to speak. Uh, thanks for sharing, Professor Holiday. I have two questions from online teaching experiences across faculties at HKU. This semester, what is the most pressing concern you hear from faculty members reading regarding assessment and what conclusions would you draw about the most effective approach to assessment? So we're basically asking you to reflect on two things, practicums and other kind of things that need that kind of approach and also your thoughts on assessment. So as I said earlier, there are some aspects that can only be done face to face. I, I mentioned how we've recreated our lab, we've reopened our labs and our studios on campus. But for off-campus work, for instance, clinical work, uh, internships with community partners, practicum for, say, social work students, that relies on a social setting, and it's not something that we can fully replicate. So there, we simply have to wait for the society to reopen. We don't yet know exactly when we'll be able to graduate some of our students taking those kinds of programs, because the access to social groups and social settings that are absolutely necessary for their study um, is not yet available. So not everything can be can be replicated virtually. And we recognize that and we will always recognize that. For Lisa's questions, thanks very much. The biggest concern about online assessment, of course, cheating. Um, we're, we're used to having proctored exams in exam halls and we now have online proctoring. And I think we've got a pretty good system. We didn't have a very good system in semester one because we invented that system in two weeks flat. But we've now had another few months and we've got a system of online proctoring that I'm very confident about, but we don't start the exam period for another couple of weeks. And so it hasn't been fully road tested yet. And that's colleagues major concern. And then um, effective assessment on an online basis. Um, We've put in, we, we've, we've invented our own platform, which we call OLEX, which enables colleagues to upload an exam paper, students to download it and then upload their answers. We've uh, created a system of online proctoring, which has very complex protocols. And we've got training sessions for students, for teachers, for invigilators. We will be recording everything, both on Panopto and on Zoom, uploading it onto the Hong Kong U server. Um, every single student will be monitored through Zoom uh, by an invigilator. So, you know, these are the things we're trying to do to ensure that our assessment system is credible and that everybody can have confidence in it. Thank you. And so we want to give you one last question. And by the way, for American audiences, we should say invigilator is like a proctor for, mm -hmm. uh, for a test. And uh, so we have a question here from CF Kwan. Would the current extensive online learning pose a hindrance or sharpening of people's communication skills? So we'll let you answer that and maybe a final thought, Professor, to wind up this conversation. Um, I, I, I think it adds diversity to the learning experience. We, we, we've, what we've done at the, at the moment in this academic year is to factor intensive mode online into what previously was face-to-face -face, so that that's given students an element of diversity that they wouldn't otherwise have had. Going forward, I think, as I said, our task, and, and, and we need to work on this before um, people's experiences fade into the background, uh, while everybody is still in this teaching and learning moment and has these new experiences to draw on, we need to capture as much of that good diversity as we possibly can. So, I mean, if we can do it well, it must be a win-win situation. We must be able to have more communication skills for students because we will be putting them in, in, in more diverse situations with more diverse challenges and stimulating them in more diverse ways. And that must be the way forward. So, I mean, this is turning into my wrap up, I guess. It was a great question to choose as the final one, which is 
you know, the, the task of all of us, I think, who are um, from regular teachers through to, to, to people who are in more administrative and managerial positions is, is to capture what's been so great about this period. There have been problems, there have been challenges. It hasn't been entirely smooth. We all made a rocky start, but we have all the, that there are benefits and positives in this process. And that's what we need to, to, to focus on and capture and make sure that it becomes institutionalized and we don't simply go back to where we were six months ago as essentially just face-to-face -face institutions. Oh, thank you so much, Professor Professor Ian Holliday. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, your insights, and also your leadership with all of us. Uh, we want to remind everyone to please go to fightcovid19.hku.hk, a repository of HKU's efforts on research and community work to combat COVID-19. The audience could revisit these global dialogue sessions on that website too. We have all of these conversations, multiple ones, and we even had a wonderful concert, Professor, of your students doing a COVID cadenza. Our yes. guest has been Ian Holiday. Thank you very much, Professor. We are very grateful to you, and we wish you and your students the very best. And to everyone who watched from around the world, thank you for watching. Thank you for participating. Thank you for sharing your questions. We're sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but we will see if we can entice Professor Holiday to come back in the months ahead and spend time with us. Thank you very much, everybody. My name is Sri Srinivasan. I'm a professor at Stony Brook School of Journalism. I'm at Sri on Twitter. Would love to hear your feedback about this, and please follow HK University on Twitter and continue to follow us and connect with us on HKU100. Thanks very much. Good night from here and good morning in Hong Kong. Thank you very much.